I wanted to go back a bit, the 1950s, mid-1950s, when uh, coal was the main source of heating. There were next to no high-rise buildings, and the uh, British uh, seaside resorts were in the heyday. It was then that researchers were testing the first treatments for Parkinson's. They knew that there was a problem with dopamine, and that was causing the movement symptoms of the condition. So they thought, let's try and replace that dopamine. Maybe that will be a cure. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. You can't just replace dopamine. We know that the treatments that we have today, they aim to replace dopamine, but they have side effects, and they don't slow or stop the progression of Parkinson's. So over time, more treatments are needed and more side effects occur. So what those researchers needed was a bigger picture. Come to today, we still don't fully understand the causes of Parkinson's, but we do have a much better understanding of why those dopamine-producing brain cells are being lost. And it's with that understanding that researchers are coming up with the ideas that may be a cure in the future. So now I want you to imagine a jigsaw puzzle. Now this is the most complicated jigsaw puzzle you've ever seen. And there's no box with the picture on that you can cheat with. It doesn't exist. Um, that is your map of Parkinson's. Now, as anyone, I hope people have done jigsaws. I'm assuming that most people have. When you start with a jigsaw, you start with the edges. You find the corner pieces, the edges, and then you fill in the middle. Once you've got the edges in place, things can start to speed up. And today, we are seeing in Parkinson's research that we think we're starting to put those edges in place, those ideas that will give us a view of the map. And with that map, with the more visual uh, knowledge of what's going on in Parkinson's, we can start to progress towards these treatments that are so desperately needed. So one of these uh, corner pieces, maybe, might have been mitochondria. So mitochondria are the, the, the batteries of the cells. And it was in 1989 that Parkinson's UK researchers first identified that there was a problem with these batteries in the cells that were being affected by Parkinson's. And that corner piece has been added to over the years, and researchers are now looking at ways that they can try and give the cells, support those mitochondria, and give the cells the energy that they need to survive. Perhaps another corner piece, or maybe certainly, definitely a uh, edge piece would be genetics. So it was in 2004 that Parkinson's UK researchers first identified a problem in the pink one gene that's associated with a very rare genetic form of Parkinson's. Now we know that the majority of people don't have a single genetic cause for their Parkinson's, but genetics does play a role. It might be a minor role, but it definitely is there playing an underlying role in Parkinson's. And we're not just interested in genetics for the fact that it's linked to the cause of Parkinson's. Over time, as we've learned more about genetics, as we've been able to work out how to manipulate genetics and change the code that's inside all of our cells, we are coming up with ways to develop gene therapies that may allow us to introduce the code into the remaining cells to help them make more dopamine or perhaps introduce the code for some protective proteins to help slow down the progression of Parkinson's. So yes, genetics, another vital piece of this Parkinson's jigsaw to the map that we need to develop new and better treatments. And over the years, researchers funded by Parkinson's UK have contributed to numerous different areas of this map, helping our understanding and moving us towards a better understanding and a better place to start building these new treatments from. So with this understanding, how do we capitalize on turning it, this knowledge into new treatments? Because frankly, understanding is great, but it doesn't cure, it doesn't help people. We need to actually turn that into new treatments. And we've heard over the last few years that the most important thing is that we speed up the translational research from ideas into new therapies and getting those new therapies into people's hands. 
we are leading our way, leading the way in initiatives that speed up research. Um, you may have heard of the Parkinson's Virtual Biotech. This is an initiative to invest in drug discovery projects, to invest in early clinical research, to make sure no good idea gets left behind. We can put money into projects that would otherwise sit on the shelf. Now, I'm sure you all saw the GDNF documentary. Got some nods. Good. I'm glad to see you're awake. Um, that was a great example of where we can invest our money to make sure that we're not leaving treatments on the shelf, that we actually test things that deserve testing, not because they're going to make money for pharmaceutical companies, but because they are a valid and worthwhile treatment that deserves testing. Now, obviously, the, tr the results from the GDNF trial weren't clear cut, but we we're incredibly proud of everything that was achieved in that trial. Indeed, the drug delivery system that they actually developed for that trial is already being used in a clinical trial in Parkinson's of a different growth factor, a different protective protein called cDNF, same family of proteins, hence some similar letters in there. Um, and yes, our Parkinson's virtual biotech is a mechanism for speeding up research by investing in that space to turn ideas into treatments. We're also looking at using data. So clinical data exists. Every trial that happens in Parkinson's produces thousands of individual measures. And in that data, there are hidden secrets that could unlock better ways of doing research. So how do we take that data and actually use it? Well, computing power has increased almost exponentially over the last decade, and we're now in a position where our computers can take large and complex data to give us answers to the most pressing problems in both society and in medicine. And it's using something called big data. So this is a new technology that's allowing us to, to look at data in a different way and to learn more from it. And our initiative, The Critical Path for Parkinson's, that we founded and co-lead, uses data from clinical trials in Parkinson's to actually change the way we're doing clinical research to make clinical trials better so that they're more likely to succeed in the future. And finally, we're not just using computer technology like that. We're also using artificial intelligence in a partnership with a company called Benevolent AI. And they're looking to use data that's already out there to help fill in parts of this map, parts of this missing picture that we desperately need to speed up the delivery of new and better treatments. The Benevolent AI project is already providing us targets that may feed into our virtual biotech and may come out the other end with a new treatment. So today we are closer than ever before to a cure. And before I hand over to the wonderful Roger Barker, I just want to leave you with one last message. We are committed to finding a cure for every person with Parkinson's as quickly as possible, but we can't do that without you. From taking part in clinical research and helping with the data, helping test new treatments, to donations that fund our vital research, obviously we can't do it without that. Um, there are so many ways you can get involved. Um, you may see that we're all wearing a little, little badge, Team Parkinson's, if you haven't heard about it already, do look for that in the future. Um, and we want to be united in an effort to change Parkinson's, to end Parkinson's forever. So we invite you to get involved and to, to join us in our united effort to end Parkinson's.